Welcome to Square Notes, the sacred music podcast. Your chance to learn about the teachings of the Catholic Church on sacred music, both in theory and practice, through interviews, discussions, and music. Your hearts and minds will be lifted up and better understand what it means to sing the praise of His glory. And now, your host, Dr. Jennifer Donaldson Novitska. Hello, listeners, and welcome to Square Notes, the sacred music podcast. I'm delighted to be joined today by my good friend, Dr. Edward Schaefer, the founder and president of the Collegium Sanctorum Angelorum, a board member of the Church Music Association of America and frequent faculty member at the CMAA's annual Sacred Music Colloquium, especially in his area of specialty, which is also our topic today. And that is the semiological approach to singing chant and the work of Dom Eugène Cardine. If this topic interests you, I hope you'll consider joining Dr. Schaefer's class this summer at St. Joseph's Seminary on this topic. It meets in the mornings, 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, from July 11th to 15th, either online or in person. To learn more about all the courses that we're offering this summer, please visit www.dunwoody.edu, spelled D-U-N-W-O-O-D-I-E, dot E-D-U, and click on Dunwoody Music. And now, on to our interview. Thanks so much for being here today with me, Ed. Thanks for having me. I'm delighted to be here. You know, you and I have been friends for many years now, and we've had so many great conversations about a topic which usually brings out the fighting spirits amongst chant practitioners, and that is the difference between the Makaro, or classical Salem school of singing, to which I subscribe, and the Cardine, or new Salem, or semiological school of singing chant, to which you subscribe. And I'm planning on doing an episode in the future that can give an in-depth comparison of the approaches of Macro, Potier, and Cardine. But for today, we'll focus on Cardine and semiology. So could you describe for our listeners a bit about the origins of the new Salem or semiological approach and who Dom Eugène Cardine was? Sure. So there's a kind of genealogy in the leaders of the chant revival. Dom Guéranger reopened Salem in 1833, actually on the Feast of St. Benedict, July 11. And he eventually appointed Dom Potier to oversee the task of chant restoration. And it was Potier who opened the now famous scriptorium. And in 1875, a young André Macaro joined the abbey where he then assisted Potier in the chant restoration work. Now, Macaro was intimately familiar with the ancient manuscripts and the ancient signs in them. In fact, his personal copy of the gradual is filled with his own writing superimposing ancient signs over the square note notation. And also his editions of the chant do show in places a certain sensitivity to the ancient nooms. For example, virtually every clevis over which Makaro places a horizontal episema corresponds to an episematic clevis in the ancient manuscripts. So the point is that that Makaro is no stranger to semiology. His student and successor was Dom Gajar. Gajar's most famous student was Dom Eugène Cardine. And Cardine was actually the first cantor at the Abbey from 1942 into the early 50s. And in 1952, he was appointed professor of Gregorian paleography, or semiology if you want to use that term, at the Pontifical College of Music in Rome. And during his years at the Pontifical College, he and his students, graduate students doing research projects, engaged in intense work studying the ancient nooms. And his famous book, Gregorian Semiology, is something of a compilation of that research. And the books on semiology by Agostoni, who was a student of Cardine, are an amplification of that research. Even so, Cardine's book is still something of the Bible on the topic. Right. So when someone is new to studying this style, does one start with learning the nooms themselves, like, you know, in a study or comparison chart, or in looking at the nooms in the context, or is Cardine's book the first part where you start, or do you start with singing? Where where do you start with this? Yeah, that's a great question, because everybody wants to dive into the nooms and learn what they mean. And when I say what they mean, They want to learn them in a very specific mathematical way, which notes are held and for how long and which signs tell me how to do that. And they want to interpret the signs in a fashion like we read music today with very specific 
measurable values for every note. When I have the opportunity, I like to start students in a different way. First, we look at the text. We decipher what's important and why. Second, we actually sing the melody without any reference to rhythm at all. Then we go back and think about how would we nuance the expression of this text with rhythmic lengthenings, agogic nuances, and so on. And we give that a try. Then we look at the signs and we see how they correspond to our analysis. And if they're the same, great, then we go get ice cream. And if they're <laughs> different, then we try to see how and why they're different. And I think this process helps to make the intimate relationship between text and music more clear. And if we're lucky, it helps to inform the way that we should approach this music. Right. So we'll get into the issue of rhythm, especially vis-a-vis -vis the text in a moment. But could you describe for us, when you are at the point of looking at the neumes, what are some of the fundamental principles by which one understands the pneumatic shapes? The shapes themselves are pretty easy to learn. Typically, they look like how the music moves. For example, if you can imagine an upside down U, so you have a line going up, an arch at the top where it peaks, and a line coming down on the right side. And now you could imagine a director showing the scola the shape of this upside down U, taking his hand upward and then coming downward for a higher note followed by a lower note. And as you know, this is what we call a clevis. So the shapes themselves are largely intuitive. Then there are the extra little things that get added to these shapes to give us information about how these notes are to be sung. For example, if we take that clevis, the upside down U, and we put an episema, a line across the top of it, right at the peak of the arch, it would tell us that both notes of the clevis are lengthened somewhat not necessarily in a measured or equal way, but in a way that will show the importance of these notes, either melodically or in relationship to the text or structurally. On the other hand, if we put that episema at the end of the neum, sticking out from the bottom of the right side of that upside down U, it would signal that the second note of the neum is important in some way and needs to be lengthened to show that. So the shapes themselves are pretty intuitive, even the signs, once you understand them, the extra little things are also pretty easy to understand. Could you say a little bit about the um, extra letters that are sometimes added above the neumes? Sure. The letters can have two different indications. Sometimes they are melodic. So, for example, you might have a clevis that would have a M next to it, and that M would stand for mediocriter, which would mean that it the second note is lower, but it's not a lot lower. It's, it's probably not as low as you might, you might intuitively think it should be. So some of them are melodic, and then some of them are, are rhythmic. A T, for example, would, would say tenete, to hold this note. Or C, for chileriter, would say, no, don't hold this note. Move this along quickly here. So there is a whole alphabet of letters and in, in some of the manuscripts, there are actually uh, shorthands for entire phrases or words. Let's move now to this topic that we laid aside for a moment, and that is the relationship of rhythm to the text. What would you say, if you had to describe the basis of how one thinks about rhythm in singing the chant according to this system, especially in relationship to the text? Yeah, well, first, as you say, we must see the music and the text as a cohesive whole. It's not words set to music. It's more like a marriage of text and music. That's really critical. The second is that the notes get altered rhythmically generally for four reasons. So they fall into four categories. One, they show the importance of the text melody at that point. Two, sometimes they prepare us for something that's coming up that's important. For example, in the uh, Makaro way of looking at things, you have a salicus, which is three rising notes, and the middle note has a vertical episema. And many people, when they interpret that, they'll lengthen the second note a little bit. So, so you have, ya -da -da. but if it's a salicus and you have the episema, it's, ya -da -da. Which is the Makaro way of doing it. Which is the Makaro way of doing it. Now, 
those often correspond to a salicus in the ancient manuscripts too, where the second note is what we call an ariscus. And that ariscus gets lengthened a little bit, but it's not because the ariscus is important, it's because it's driving us to the top note of that salicus. So it's not ya da dum and it's not ya da dum but it's ya da dum it has a push so sometimes sometimes these little signs show that something that's important and sometimes they show us something that is coming up that's important the third thing is they also help us to understand the modal structure on which these melodies are hung and then finally they help us understand the rhythm of the melismas the long sets of melodies where there is no text and sometimes they show us the rhythm of those melismas in and of themselves and also in the way that they fit into the modal structure. So I think those are the four principles or the four primary things that we learn from these signs. Yeah, that's really helpful, especially this last point, because that's a, a common, you know, point of contention when these <laughs> comparison of, of styles come about, you know, people say, well, you know, well, what about the melisma when there is no text and what do your signs mean then? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, what you said was really sensitive and, and nuanced in that. Yeah, it's quite it's quite fascinating too because sometimes they will give an entirely different feel to a melisma because of the way that they emphasize certain structural notes or certain notes that are important for one reason or another. They'll change the entire way the melisma feels. Right. So when you're preparing to teach or direct a chant, what does your score study look like? You know, what are the things you say to your singers then after that score study? And what sorts of things do you try to communicate to them, maybe in a nonverbal way through conducting or through your own voice? Well, my own study looks a lot like some of the things I've already said. Now, some of this I do intuitively because I've been doing it for a long time and things happen at the same time. But if I were to dissect it, I would say I think about the text. I think about how does the melody marry with the text to express it? What's the modal structure of the melody? And then how do the neumes enhance all this? The neumes really don't tell us things that aren't already inherent in the music. They just make it clearer. So what do they show that's important? What do they help us see that's coming up that's important? Or how do they enhance my hearing and understanding of the modal structure and of the melismas? Now, when I'm working with, with the scola, this year I have a new scola. We're just starting at the Collegium, and we had a new scola. And it's taken almost most of the year, and I'm feeling like they're finally intuitively starting to pick things up. We don't have as much time in a rehearsal to do as much sort of score study as we would like because that's just the way it is. You have an hour or a little bit more, and you've got to prepare five proper chants for Sunday. You, you've just got to get through a lot of music. Most of the time, I will say, do it like I do it. <laughs> and then I sing it and they sing it. I, I'm looking for ways to mark the score so they can pick things up. And so far, one of the best ways is that I circle things. And I just say, when we circle them, they're important. And let me show you how those things happen. I also do a little bit of board work. I'll, I'll take a phrase or a noom or something in a rehearsal and show them how that works. And hopefully they begin to pick that up and look at it in other ways. And then I'm actually trying to devise a modified notation system. And it's in an antiphonale that we're putting together for the college where the square note notation is tweaked a little bit to express some of the nuances in the ancient nooms. So far, the circles seem to work better, but they are <laughs> picking up but they are picking up the nuanced notation too. I just haven't taken the time to explain the details of it. So some things go by them, but that's not because they're not seeing it. It's just because I haven't explained it to them. Right. So if you had to describe the characteristics or the, of the overall sound you're looking for when you're directing a chant in the system, what's your, like, your dream sound that you're able to produce from a scola? Well, it should be in tune. <laughs> 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 but on the one hand, it, it should feel alive and vibrant. That is, it should feel like music that even if they don't know all the text, that they understand how musically, how it expresses the theology of the text in a profound and profoundly beautiful way. And conversely, on the other hand, it should never be stodgy or what I would call equal note rhythmically in such a way that listeners would have a sense that the music is being counted in some way. That's antithetical to to my way of approaching it. 
more on this topic. You and I have had several occasions to compare how you'd interpret the same chant as me with each of us using our own preferred method. And we've often been surprised by the similarities that we come up with in phrasing, etc. And this is especially true when taking into account, as all practitioners of Makaro's method should, the whole of the method, especially what he calls the greater rhythm. And in this greater rhythm, the twos and the threes for which the method is so famous are simply an intermediate building block in understanding the entire rhythmic and phrase structure of a piece. And it's in this greater rhythm, especially, that we have found the most common ground. But looking at which phrases are the most important because of their place in the structure, the text, the pitch, especially in relationship to the mode, etc. How do you experience in your practice of our Cardine's method also a smaller division of the bigger structures that you find in Makaro. But how do you how do you experience that in Cardine? First of all, let me just say, it shouldn't be surprising that there are similarities. The overall structure doesn't change regardless of how you try to divide it up. The major difference is in those groupings of notes in twos and threes by Makaro. Uh, they seem to be, and you would be better at this than I, but they seem to be relating something to poetic meter, like grouping notes in feet, in a way. Okay. Uh, I'll, I would let you explain that in more detail. Yeah. I would, not- I would say though, the, the one clarification I would make is that uh, the ictus placement, which de- defines between a group of two and three, the ictus is not an accent. So in, in that way, it, it is differentiated from poetic feet, which are defined by where the accent falls in the groups of two or three syllables. Yeah. But even, even feet, um, I don't think accents the right word. It's, in classical Latin, it would be a, a, a bit of a lengthening. Okay, sure. They're, so, they're longer syllables. I just want to make clear the typical uh, <laughs> the typical yeah. mantra about the Macaron method, the ictus is not an accent. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I didn't mean to apply that. <laughs> yeah, um, okay, great. Cardine wouldn't look at the music that way. Right. Uh, his groupings, I think the term he often uses is the incise, would have more to do with just the text and the shapes of the melody you might even use the the terminology of the rise and fall of smaller units. I don't think that would be foreign to him. He wouldn't see it in groups of twos and threes. What What is your experience like of singing it, though? Do you, I mean, do you have an experience of that at all? I mean, what, when you're thinking about stringing things together, for example, do you see them noom by noom? What is your experience of stringing the nooms together at the point in which there is a pneumatic break? It's a combination of, of text and melody, text, melody, and mode. I, I never experience it in groups of twos and threes. They're, ju- they're grouped just according to the nature of the music and, and its relationship to the text. I just don't even think of it that way. What are some of the most important manuscripts one looks to to find these nooms? There aren't very many. And I, and I have to say here, this is where technology has really proved to be a benefit. At my age, I'm looking at technology a lot, and I'm seeing that we have a society that's generally addicted to technology, and and it's it's destroying our ability to communicate. It's destroying our ability to think. But technology in and of itself is evil. It's just how you use it. And the manuscript study has been greatly benefited by technology. All the important manuscripts have been vectorized, and they are online, and I can do research that, that I could never do without that benefit. Could you mention a few of the websites that you frequently find uh, helpful in indexing and categorizing, make, making these things available? Yeah, I wasn't thinking about the websites. I was thinking about the manuscripts themselves. Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, Cantus is probably the, the, the major um, place to go. It's a, it's a warehouse for all kinds of, you, you look up a particular melody and you'll find 20, 30, 40 versions of it. And those that they have can attach to a, a particular website with a manuscript, they'll, they'll link it that way. That's probably the easy one. That's the one stop shop is to go to the Cantus database. Right. So um, I'm seeing here a, an easy URL to remember is contusindex.org. It's also yeah, hosted that would do it. At, at the University of Waterloo in Canada. Yep. That would do it. And let me talk a little bit about the manuscripts, if you don't mind. Great. There are about a half a dozen that are really important. There's one 10th century, an early 10th century manuscript in the City Library at Lens. It's the only manuscript that has that particular notation developed to that extent. There are a few precursors, but there's only that one. We're also very lucky it's been redone. Until recently, you had to have Flash 
to read it. And of course, Flash is no longer oh, supported boy. on. And uh, so somebody has redone it. So thank heavens you can you can get back to it now. And then there are another half a dozen manuscripts that date between the 9th and 11th centuries that employ a notation, generally what we call the St. Gall family. Two of these are particularly important for the antiphons of the office. We call them the Hartker manuscripts, uh, St. Gall 390 and 91. But these two and the other four also have the chance of the mass. And they come from the monastery at St. Gall and the monastery at Einsiedeln. Now, there are a lot of later manuscripts that are helpful for melodic reconstruction. It's important to note that these early manuscripts don't actually give us specific pitches. They give us the direction of the melodies, but they're not concerned with that. They're more concerned with preserving an oral tradition, the way of singing this music. They're not so concerned with the pitches because the melodies were alive in the culture. Everyone knew them. So when you're looking at these different manuscripts, and especially you're, you're mentioning two main families of neumes, what does one notice in what unifies them? Is it a geographical unification, a chronological unification? How does that work? It is kind of interesting that even across, there are lo local geographic idiosyncrasies. They are more prevalent. That is various different families in Gaul and in Germania, in, in, in the Germanic countries, they're more unified. <laughs> so, you know, we talk about you know, the, the Germans are the people that gave us the Volkswagen, the people that could, you know, unify everything. And that that inclination in the culture seems to go back well into the early Middle Ages. <laughs> <laughs> Even across that, the notation of the Law and the St. Gall families, they're remarkably similar. And not only were the melodies carefully preserved, but also the manner of performance is very, very similar. Now, there are differences, but generally those differences are subtle. They're not major. The other thing I would say is that as the manuscripts get later, the rhythmic signs start to disappear. It's a really fascinating development. So even by the 11th century, we were already seeing other types of notation, very pitch-specific notation. And the systems created to show this specificity of pitches sacrifice the signs that showed the rhythmic nuances to accomplish this goal. And it appears that even in the manuscripts preserved in the older notation, like some later Sangal manuscripts, by the 11th century, the, the rhythmic signs were starting to disappear. Oh, that's interesting. What can students expect to learn in your class this summer? Sure. Well, of course, we'll learn the signs themselves and what they mean. But more importantly, I hope they'll begin to experience and to sing chant as something that is vibrant and extraordinarily subtle. And when they experience this, I hope they'll begin to understand what a profound gift this music is to the faith, to the church, and to Western society. That leads us actually into a bigger project that you're working on. You're not just a semiologist, um, although we'll come back to some great resources that you've created for that, that topic in a moment. But could you tell us a little bit about um, what you do in your day job? <laughs> <laughs> it's an, actually a day and night job. <laughs> Indeed. Um, I am founder and president of Collegium Sanctorum Angelorum, which goes by the Collegium. We are a newly opened. Tomorrow morning we will finish our first academic year, liberal arts college that is a classical in its curriculum, but more importantly, we embrace tradition. We're not just, we don't accommodate tradition, we embrace tradition. Uh, we do that for a couple of reasons. One, if we have a classical curriculum that focuses on writers like Augustine and Aquinas and the great doctors and fathers of the saint of the church, it only makes sense that the curriculum, that the mass that we, our spiritual formation is also centered on the classical mass that fed the, the faith and spirituality of those great saints. We also do it because if you look at the data, if you want to stay close to the church and you think staying close to the church is important to your faith and to your salvation, then then you really need to think about tradition very carefully because that's where the church is growing and that's where people are remaining faithful. So that's the nuts and bolts of who we are. We are a new college that is identified by its embracement of tradition and classical curriculum. And what's this, the college's website if people want to learn more about it? T-H-E, the hyphen collegium.org. Right. 
Great. And could you also share with us um, the website? You spent so many years creating really great teaching resources for semiology that would be a great uh, foray into this area for students and anyone interested. And where can they find that information? So you'll find some stuff on my own website, which is edwardshafer.net. But if you go to gregoriansemiology.com, gregoriansemiology.com, and we'll actually use that in the workshop. This Well, we'll use some worksheets drawn from it. There is a whole curriculum that is de- in the process of being developed. The curriculum is all there. The videos have not all been done because of another project that superseded that in, in uh, urgency, which I'll discuss in a second. But it pretty much all the nooms of Sangal family and long are laid out in categories. There are exercises, tests, quizzes you can do to test yourself. It's really a full self-learning curriculum. The only thing that's missing, we don't have videos for all five levels. I think we've got videos for one or maybe two levels. Uh, but it's still a great resource where it is. We'll finish it out some year. Right. And also, of course, the, the experience of coming together and singing this chant with a, a director who knows what they're doing. Yes, of course. That's Yeah. <laughs> I'm just, you wanted the resource, so that was... That was, it's there. Um, The other thing I've been working on related to this is what I'm calling uh, antifinale duplex. So we sing lauds and vespers at the school. Most students come and they have no experience of the divine office. So I thought for years, how can we make this an easier experience? If you've ever worked your way through a diurnal or a, or a breviary or, or an antifinale, it can be very complicated, especially on feast days, you're turning five, six, seven different places in the volumes. So we, how can we make this simpler? So we've created an antifinale that has very minimal page turning, but we've also pointed out all the Psalms. They just have to read through it. They don't have to, they don't have to know other things to make this work. And in that, we have developed a notation that helps infuse some of the nuances of the ancient nooms, and we've imposed this, the nooms, sort of like the gradual I triplex, but this is the antifinale duplex. So it has a square note notation and a Sangal notation for the office over it. And that is, I would say, in its in beta version, we've probably got 12 of the projected 20 volumes that are, are have been least used this year and have been proofed, and so we'll correct them over the summer. So some of them we'll be able to publish next by next fall, and and you'll find them on the website. You'll be able to go to the website and find out where they are. And we'll use some of them in the workshop. I'll have some pages from them, so you'll see how that unfolds. That's great. It's a huge task, definitely. <laughs> Yeah, it's like everything I get myself into. It's always <laughs> always bigger than what I think it's going to be. <laughs> <laughs> well, Ed, I'm looking forward to seeing you at the CMAA Colloquium this summer. That's also something you're hosting at the Collegium in Hagerstown. And uh, we'll, I'll look forward also to um, teaching with you um, this summer. And I, you. I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. <laughs> Thanks so much for being here today. All right. Thank you for having me. We hope you've enjoyed listening to Square Notes, the sacred music podcast with Dr. Jennifer donaldson Novitska. For more information about this episode, sacred music resources, or upcoming events, visit our website at sacredmusicpodcast.com. You can subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, or your favorite podcast app. If you enjoy our podcast, please write us a review on iTunes. This improves our iTunes ranking and helps others find out about the podcast. The music you heard at the beginning of this episode is Hec Dies by William Byrd, sung by the London Oratory Schola Cantorum Boys Choir, directed by Charles Cole from the CD Sacred Treasures of England. The music at the conclusion of this podcast is from the Prelude and Fugue in G Major, BWV 550 by Johann Sebastian Bach, performed by Jennifer Donaldson Novitska. We look forward to having you join us next time. And until then, may we sing the praise of his glory.